throughout the day today that only aircraft would be flying once security measures were implemented and implemented soundly at U.S. airports. We can tell you some of the new security precautions that will be taking place at America's airports. No knives, including plastic knives. No curbside check-in, which has been the policy at many big airports in large cities across the country. Only ticketed passengers allowed past metal detectors, and in certain large airports, that has already been implemented at certain times. Higher standards for security personnel and more federal marshals at large airports. Earlier, we were told several hundred could be sent out to various airports, the marshals anyway, to ensure that security is stepped up. At this time, that's what we know from the Department of Transportation. Airline travel still a bit slow and sluggish, as one can understand, but Joey, at some point it will return to a greater sense of normalcy, just not now. And a reminder to all of us, of course, the CNN's coverage continues. We mm -hmm. see so much, so many updates about the investigation, about what is going on, about rescue efforts that are still underway. Let us not forget the people involved and the amount of pain there is. So many cities and so many homes today, in Washington and in New York and in all of us as we continue to watch what happens. We will continue our coverage now in Washington and New York. Judy Woodruff and Aaron Brown in those cities. Thank you, Joey and Bill. I am Judy Woodruff in Washington. Aaron? We're, we have been tracking for the last, I guess, 45 seconds to a minute, a small plane that has essentially flown the length of Manhattan. We can't see tail markings. You're, you can just barely see it still. You see it going into the smoke. Um, again, clearly, no planes are supposed to be in the air. Uh, if that is, in fact, a private plane, we are enormously curious what it is doing up there. And, it, and I, I, I'll tell you that we're a little concerned there for a while. I would gather, I can't see it anymore, uh, that it's over the harbor uh, now. Um, in any case, we, in the several hours now, three or four hours we've been up here, have not seen a single small plane, of uh, what might have been a private plane. We've seen a number of military jets, lots of helicopters, uh, but we have not seen a plane like that. Uh, in any case, the scene here now, a day and a half, is uh, you can see quite clearly behind me uh, what was building number seven of the World Trade Center. The smoke continues to pour out, the ash, the asbestos uh, down there. There are thousands of rescue workers who continue this very slow, agonizingly slow process of uh, trying to get the fires out, try to uh, get that these buildings as secure as possible so they can get in there and see if they can find anyone who is still alive. That is still what the out at this point, secure the building and find people. It has been very slow today, Judy. Well, Aaron, we're going to be prepared to come back to you, of course, at, at a moment's notice, whether it is uh, having to do with the rescue efforts or the progress of that small airplane. Uh, meantime, here in Washington, the story that uh, many of us have been focused on for the last few hours is new word from the White House uh, about why the president did not head back to Washington any sooner uh, yesterday. And for the latest on that, Let's uh, let's go to the White House to our senior correspondent there, John King. Uh, John, we know the president's uh, meeting now or has been meeting with his national security team. Let's begin there, Judy. The president having his second meeting of the day with his national security team, the defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, General Hugh Shelton, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on hand for this meeting. And we're also told that later this hour, once that meeting is over, the president will travel to the Pentagon for his first first-hand look at the devastation caused by that aircraft striking the Pentagon yesterday. Again, the president later this hour will travel to the Pentagon to get a look at the devastation and the research and recovery effort still underway at the Pentagon. Now, he's in that national security meeting right now. CNN is told by senior administration officials that among the items on the agenda, the beginning of the discussions about just what the United States might do if the investigation continues to go as our sources throughout the day have been telling us, pointing increasing evidence that these attacks yesterday in New York and here at the Pentagon in the view of senior U.S. officials increasingly being traced to associates and the network of suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden Earlier today, Mr. Bush met with his national security team the first time, and he indicated that the American people should be patient, give the investigation time to run its course, but the president called this an act of war, and he promised there would be consequences. 
The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient, we will be focused, and we will be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve, but make no mistake about it, we will win. Now, as part of that effort, we know the president had a number of conversations with other international leaders today. Secretary of State Colin Powell reaching out as well. The White House very happy with a statement by the NATO alliance that it considers these attacks on the United States to be an attack on the NATO alliance. That is a suggestion that if and when the United States decides to respond militarily, it will get some help from its key allies. Judy. And John, what about that, uh, that information the White House was beginning to share with reporters today that uh, they had some information that the White House itself, Air Force One, uh, might well have been target. That's right, Judy. We are now told by White House officials that they believe, and they say they have credible and reliable information, that the plane that struck the Pentagon indeed had the White House as its initial target, that that plane was intending to strike the White House, but instead, for reasons the White House says it either cannot explain or will not explain, then veered off and struck the Pentagon. Now, the president obviously was not in Washington at the time. He was in Sarasota, Florida. White House officials also saying one of the reasons the president, and the main reason the president did not come directly back to Washington, as many were looking for at that time of crisis, was that it had credible information that Air Force One could be a target of the terrorists. Now, let's remember what happened. The president began the day in Sarasota, Florida. Then he went to a military installation in Louisiana. At that time, White House officials saying there were still aircraft unaccounted for. The FAA had ordered all commercial airliners to land at that point because of the four hijackings. The White House saying the president did not return to Washington at that point because there was a credible threat and aircraft still unaccounted for. So the president instead went to another military installation in Nebraska, had a meeting of his national security team via teleconference, then flew back to Washington and remember those extraordinary pictures. Air Force One returning to Andrews Air Force Base with fighter jets just off the wing. You see one here, the wing of Air Force One, a giant military 747, fighter jets off to the left in this case, fighter jets seen off to the right and around the plane as well. At this time though, as these pictures were taken, we had been told by administration officials that the skies were clear, these steps just taken as an extra precaution as the president returned to Washington. But again, trying to convince the American people of the depth of the crisis here, and as the president deliberates what to do about it, how to respond, the administration going on the record to saying it has credible, reliable information that the White House, the home of the President of the United States, and Air Force One, the plane that carries him around the country and around the world, were targets. Judy. And quickly, just to reiterate, John, they were telling you something somewhat different yesterday. Well, Secret Service officials were saying throughout the day yesterday that they did not believe the plane was in any jeopardy, Air Force One. So that is one conflict that, uh, from the information yesterday. And we were told yesterday, and there's no conflict here, it's just another targeting issue, that that plane that crashed outside of Pittsburgh U.S. officials also believe was beginning to veer toward Washington, and they believe that it had three potential targets, Camp David, the White House, or the United States Capitol. All right, John King, well, we know you're going to continue to follow that story as well as uh, everyone, of course, very much interested in these discussions that you say are just getting underway about what steps next the United States should take. And, of course, we'll be interested to know what, who the president would be consulting with or whom uh, as, he, uh, as he moves through this. Now let's go to New York and to Aaron. Judy, thank you. Uh, Gary Tuckman has been on the ground in, with a video phone and moving towards the buildings all day long. Uh, and he joins us now. And Gary, I gather that you have gotten a look, an up-close look at uh, at least it's something approaching ground zero. Approaching ground zero, literally ground zero, as close as you could possibly get to the damage. And I have to tell you, first of all, there are no cameras allowed at ground zero. And to be frank, I'm not sure reporters are allowed at ground zero either. However, a very kind soul, a medical professional, decided to take me along to the site, wanted me to see it, wanted me able to be able to tell America and the world about what happened because she just thought it was so horrible. And I have to tell you something, this is much, much, much worse than I possibly would have imagined. And we've been here for two days now, just four blocks away. You can't tell how bad it is until you're right on the site. And let me tell you, first of all, what I saw. There are at least 10 blocks in each direction of heavy damage. It's not just the World Trade Center complex. It is hundreds of other businesses that have been heavily destroyed, moderately destroyed, or slightly destroyed. Some of the businesses that have been destroyed are Burger King, 
a well-known department store next to the World Trade Center called Century 21. Um, J&R Music World is a well-known record store and computer store and electronics store that has some damage. For blocks and blocks, about a half a mile from north to south, there is heavy debris in the streets. There are cars tipped over, trucks tipped over, just lying in the streets. It reminds me of a ride at Universal Studios called Earthquake. And when you go on the Earthquake ride, everything flips over and things catch fire and there's debris and there's sand. And that's what it looked like to me when I got there. Gary, the when, Gary when you look at these buildings and you talk about them being either heavily damaged or destroyed, uh, in this 10-block area, have these buildings been crushed? Have they been burned out? What is it that either damaged or destroyed them? Many of the buildings next to the World Trade Center complex have been crushed and burned out. The ones farther away just have some damage to them. But I've got to tell you, Aaron, one of the scariest things is there's a 20-story building right next to the World Trade Center complex, which has a huge hole in it, which many of the rescuers on the scene, and I should tell you there are at least 1,500 to 2,000 people on the scene climbing the wreckage, which is at point 75 to 80 feet tall, they are scared this building is going to collapse on top of them. These are very brave people. And I have to tell you another thing. And they are in this building or on this building? They are on top of, they are on top of the wreckage of the World Trade Center building where the, where, the two, where the two towers stood. Many of them are, this is very sad, but it's true, many of them are holding pans in their hand to collect body parts. I also have to tell you that the temporary morgue has been set up in a damaged Brooks Brothers store in a shopping complex right next to the World Trade Center complex that was Gary, damaged. Gary, are, were you able to see the towers or what is left of the towers themselves? I stood right next to the towers, Aaron, and you, there, some of the pillars are still standing up. They are in danger of imminent collapse. These people are extremely brave. There's certainly a lot of work they cannot do. And if there are survivors, and they certainly hope there are survivors still in pockets and voids in the middle of this, they can't get to them right now because there are tons and tons of wreckage that they just can't possibly remove. This is a job that will take so long. I should, I should also tell you, Aaron, that there is a room set up to treat survivors, and I went to that room. The room was completely empty. The morgue, the Brooks Brothers, has a number of bodies number of body parts. It's very sad. It's pitiful. And it's much, I, Frank, I got to tell you, frankly, it is much worse than I possibly could have imagined. All right. Gary, just st stand out for a minute and, and collect your thoughts a bit, and we'll get back to you uh, and this extraordinary reporting that you've been doing uh, all day long. Investigators uh, along the East Coast from Providence to South Florida have been trying to put pieces of the puzzle together. Bill Delaney, our Boston Bureau chief, joins us now. Tell us where they are. Bill, good evening. Good evening to you, Aaron, and authorities here moving swiftly on several fronts in Boston and in its environs, perhaps most dramatically in the heart of Boston, in Copley Square, venerable, usually tranquil Copley Square, where, where FBI in complete SWAT regalia, heavily armed, moved into the Weston Copley Hotel today around midday. They went in there to go after... Uh, individuals they are interested in using as material witnesses in trying to sort out what happened here. Robert Mueller himself, FBI director, stressing at a press conference that the three individuals taken into custody at the Weston Hotel uh, are, are, were not arrested, they are not suspects, but brought in for questioning thousands gathering in Copley Square to watch all this today in Boston, Aaron. And uh, just briefly, there was the Amtrak train in Providence. Uh, can you help us there? Yes, uh, an Arab individual at least once, uh, at least one Aaron taken into custody, but the FBI now cautioning us, uh, telling us, in fact, that they had nothing to do with that, suggesting, of course, then strongly that this individual uh, probably didn't have anything to do uh, with what we're trying to sort out here, uh, the, the hijackings Bill, of these uh, two airplanes yesterday. Thank you. That kind of information is as important as the other kind. Somebody doesn't have anything to do with it. It's someone who might. Uh, similar operations have been going on in Florida, in South Florida. Susan Candiotti has been tracking that, and she joins us now from Vero Beach, Florida. Susan, good evening to you. Good evening, Aaron. We've been here for several hours now, and moments ago, at least a dozen FBI agents who have been here since roughly 5.30 in the morning pulled out of here. Now, they spent several hours here, and at one point, a few hours this afternoon, uh, executed search warrants on